Well, shalom and good morning. I guess before we get started, um, it's a little bit different, but we would like to see if anybody would want to volunteer to... Uh, to help Jeff with the microphones, walking microphones yeah, around. Yeah, because this you is going to be an interactive... Okay, just, <laughs> All right, Darla. Darla's help. got it. Okay, great. Awesome. Cool. Well, good morning, everybody. This is a little bit different than a normal seminar. This is something that Bernard and I did, uh, Roger and I did last year. It, was, it went really well, and uh, we're going to have two of these uh, opportunities. And this is an interactive discussion. Yeah. Last, uh, after last feast, uh, someone had suggested or actually commented that something that they felt was lacking in our church culture for a long time, maybe all of Christian maybe all of religious culture actually, is the time for folks to ask questions, comment, disagree, challenge, whatever, um, you know, whatever's being taught, whatever's being presented, that sort of thing. Uh, and so that's something that really hasn't been done a whole lot in general and thought, well, why don't we do that? The fee, especially if we don't fill up all the seminars, let's make a time to have some interaction, uh, you know, what you've thought about feast presentation so far or that sort of thing. Not so much on the nuts and bolts and the logistics. I mean, that's a whole different thing. But, you know, as far as religious uh, or spiritual matters, you know, doctrines or just, uh, you know, something that you've learned that you thought was interesting or a comment you might have, something you want to share, maybe a miracle that you witnessed or, you know, whatever, that sort of thing. So and we uh, get a discussion going, we, or court events, even yeah, in relation we, to what's being taught here. Yeah, um, which is interesting because if you if you think back to the time of, of Yeshua Christ, you know, in a synagogue service, they would open the scrolls, they'd read Torah, and then they spend the rest of the afternoon arguing about it <laughs> or talking about it, and that was a, that was a service. And oh, she's already she's got. All right, comments. here we go. So we have nothing planned at all. Actually, yeah, we so. have no topics. This is all up yeah. whatever spirit leads. Well, just to follow up with what you said, Bernard, uh, that this isn't a part of our church culture. Um, we, in our local fellowship group, uh, started from day one with this kind of format. And 90% of our messages are either um, sharpening iron with iron or at the end, we, we usually discuss as long as the message was. And my mother has been in the church for 55 years. And she just um, testified that the last year of her Christian life, she has learned more and grown more in the one year previous it, when we started this format. So this really does work. Um, when someone up here expresses a thought, we may have three or four thoughts that go deeper or tie into something else. So this format lets the discussion be spirit-led. So, and it often goes wherever the spirit is moving for that topic in the group. So I just want to say this will work. So. Real, real quick, just a comment on that. Uh, <clears throat> years ago when I first started, uh, when God first started to open my eyes to, uh, you know, Sabbath, let's say, and holy days and whatnot, we had a little living room congregation of, I don't know, five or six or seven, it varied sometimes, but very small group. And we would sit there and listen, you know, and be, and it, we'd be listening to someone speaking and, on a cassette deck, you know, and we'd pause it because, well, wait a minute, uh, what do they say there? And pause it, and we'd have a little Bible study. Sometimes, Sometimes we would talk for 30, 45 minutes on whatever that question was. And, okay, let's continue now, you know. And I personally, I think most of my knowledge, growth, doctrinal growth, that sort of thing, uh, I got through that process. Uh, spiritual growth, I'm still working on it. You know, I think that's the hard part. But as far as the doctrinal stuff, because it gave us, we took time and we did, we care. I mean, everybody cares, right? We're seeking truth, right? So, you know, you dig in and, and whatnot. So it worked really well for me and it's worked great for our, our, our little congregation back home. We try to have more interactive, uh, you know, time, whether it's during or after messages, we try to do that, you know, anyway. Yeah, that's awesome. So 
Um, I guess one of the things that, that's a blessing of, of having an interactive fellowship, we'll kind of get, get started here. Um, you know, we live in a crazy chaotic world. Is, has anyone noticed any particular themes so far? Yeah, I guess let me back up. <clears throat> Roger and I decided when we started uh, the, uh, the, the Feast Fellowship here, you know, a lot of the corporate groups, which uh, Roger and I have been part of, uh, you know, leadership at the top will have a pamphlet of the theme for the feast, and they'll hand out guidelines that the speakers have to stay within so that, you know, it's constructed from the top down. We didn't want to do that. Uh, we don't, the seminars, yes, so we could get the subject matter in the feast planner, which I have to put together a uh, you know, month before the feast. But for the sermons and the messages, uh, we're both of the mindset, we're going to let the spirit lead. We don't want to, we don't want to need, we don't need the titles. We don't need the, the messages uh, of what they're about. Like, we'll see what the spirit leads. And that's usually a better indicator of what God wants to establish as a theme for us uh, to get. So I guess the first question, just to throw it out there, um, Anyone notice any particular uh, uh, run-throughs or themes that you're noticing in the messages and the seminars that, that, that strikes any of you? Deb? Oh, I'll well, we got to get a microphone. microphone. <laughs> she does this at home, by the way. <laughs> you can hold, you, on. hold on to it because you have a comment. <laughs> the microphone. Oh, I forget. I'm yeah. sorry. Other than ish. <laughs> and, and I've used ish for years because I'll say, you know, that about nine-ish. You know, it, it, it works really well, sorry. Um, however, I believe that when Ben spoke about light, um, th that is a theme and um, you did as well. I'm sorry, I don't Jeannie. remember your name. Jeannie. And um, the understanding light from the perspective of science and, but more than that, closer? Okay is the that without light we'll be in darkness and i i believe that's a theme that the spirit yeah. is trying to bring out and i for one am so excited about being able to talk because my church experience was not that i was told to be quiet so i appreciate that and that y'all still will love me yeah. oh yes of course we love you mm -hmm. did you have a comment Yes, the theme I've noticed the most is um, that we should all be busy doing something for the kingdom of God, and every single message seems to be applied to that theme that um, we all need to be focused on the work of God, uh, working on our spiritual selves, but we're being more outward focused because I think the church as a whole has been more inward focused and not well, let's reach the world, but let's reach the world only in these prescribed ways. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's very profound. Yes. I agree with that. Jeannie has a comment. Um, your first comment to do with uh, being inspired to do something or prepare something for the assembly. And when I think back, I had a really rough summer because I had said I was going to give my thing on the two sticks, the weathering of the two sticks. And God wouldn't let me do it. I have I'm about three quarters finished with it now that I prepared my first part. But my first part, he kept telling me to go back to the beginning and look at the light. And I really didn't want to do that. But when I got here, I heard Brother Ben talking about ambassadors, light, and everything that I had chose to talk about, we were both inspired by the same topic. And I think it's to lead the people because, and we heard about, I, is it Brother David? Uh, about the persecution that we will have? That was John, that was John. <laughs> okay, so all of that, combined we need to know where we're coming from and where we're going and I think that's the whole theme of this feast is preparing us for the near future as we see it. Wow that just hit me upside the head especially after my seminar tomorrow yes being prepared and ready and able to um, overcome and endure I think is going to be good themes yes Darla can you get further away from the speaker 
Thanks. There's something I should remind people, because I've noticed during this, uh, already during the feast, somebody might be speaking right next to the, that speaker, and it's hard to get the microphone not to squeal if you're so close to it. Okay, don't let me lose my train of thought. <laughs> <clears throat> the theme I've seen so far <clears throat> is not just preparing us for what's to come, but it's our attitudes going into what's coming. How we're treating each other in the here and now with what God's given us now. I think our own personal fellowship back home, which is Fellowship of the Word, went through a lot of changes in the last almost two years. And I don't think the growth could take place until like Bernard and Roger were going through a lot of the scriptures about a woman's role in the church. You know, Mike and him's dealt with it. Women have more role in the church than what's been given to them. And their spirits have been crushed and squelched for so long. Now, granted, we know we cannot be in a man's position doing a lot of things because men were built to be stronger than us. However, like Sarah was talking about her mother, she's learned more in the last year because we're able to have a voice to ask a question if we're not clear on something. Because sometimes our husbands may be busy, have something going on, or they come at it with a certain approach that you can get something from someone else, you know, another pastor, another elder or even ladies just getting together and hashing out stuff hey let's figure this out because we all come women most women i know are more on the nurturing side versus a man's gonna come at it from this strong point of view and sometimes we need to be dealt with in a little bit more what word tenderly cut, cut yes tenderly fashion because we're easily hurt and I think it's a lot of stuff that's been going on amongst us as brothers and sisters. We're tearing each other down, and it's got to stop. we got to be building each other up. God's calling warriors right now. We know the dark things that are out there right now, and it's just getting harder and harder. I worry about my grandkids. I should not, but I do. Any kid I see in here, even this 18-year-old young man, I'm thinking, the world's a horrible place. You know, what's their future going to look like they're facing battles that I didn't have to face and we got to lift them up and build them up like you were talking about and we spoke about it before earlier in the week where Moses had his hands up when war was going on and then his brother Aaron and her come up and when he held his arms up they kept winning the battle and that's what I've seen so far is how we speak to each other and this is a true story I can't remember and I meant to look it up because I was going to put it in my scripture reading tomorrow I can't remember if it was a high school or a college that did this experiment. They had two plants. One they spoke great things to, spoke life into it, and the other they beat it down, was negative and everything. And the one that they spoke negative to for so long, it wilted over and died. We got to speak life into each other. And I love you all, and I'm grateful for everybody here. I can't begin to explain. This is my family. I have a biological family, but this is my eternal family. Amen. And I want to see us all there together. So that's the theme I've seen so far. I want to pop on something you said. Someone had talked about. Didn't you mention that in a slide mm -hmm. that you were going to pass up on, on the shape of uh, the, water the water crystals? You can eat a mic. Get a, can you get, get Ben a mic? Hand. Just cause you in your right mind, don't give me. And I gotta get away from the. Uh, that's good enough. Right? That's yeah. right. Right. I just okay. love that it tied into what your seminar was, which she just said about the flower wilting. I just popped in my. Head. Ben talked about that. We saw yeah. visuals for that. I left. My wife said I, I left a cliffhanger for those that were at the seminar. Yeah. <laughs> so we we going we gonna, we've already done the background already. So we know about vibration. We all, so we're gonna pick it up from where we left off. But that slide, for those of you that didn't see it, it was a slide of uh, what happens to uh, molecules of water when you write certain words on it, okay? And, um, and what Darla is mentioning is that this experiment was done by Dr. Mars Marsu Emoto. It t back, goes back 20 years, and it talked about the impact of words basically on reality. Okay, and we just think words is words, but words, you know, like I covered in the seminar, is vibration and it is life. 
you know, Christ talks about light and life. That's, those two go together. And the, set, the slide said, if you put, if you said, I hate you on a glass of water, and you put that under a microscope, the molecules become very ugly. And then if you say, well, I thank you, or I love you, or gratitude, it almost looks like a crystal of like diamonds. It's an amazing thing. You, if, so if you haven't seen it, I'll put it, put it back up there on, on th Thursday when we pick it back up. But it's a really a good visual of, of the impact of what we say and how we treat each other. And that doesn't mean we don't have to be speaking the truth, but the Bible says we can speak it in love. Yeah. 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 Interestingly, um, I want to touch on this because I've been talking about that for so long. You said that it was 20 years ago that that study was done with the words approximately? Okay, well, I was a kid. I don't know exactly how old I was, but I would say maybe approaching my teens or so. And my mom told me about a study or an article probably that uh, she read back then. So this is like, I don't know, in the maybe let's say 70s sometime, maybe 80-ish. Um, there was somebody else, another Japanese uh, scientist, who instead of writing... Uh, on the water, what he did is either is, is speak, uh, either prayers, beautiful things on one on, on you know one glass of water, and then negativity and hate on the other, and so uh, and the same thing happened. This is that much longer ago, so this has been corroborated over and over again in different ways. And what just dawned on me is the possibility that. It might, it might not be the word itself that's written, but the spirit in which it is written. Because, you know, what if it was in a different language? The water doesn't know. But the spirit of what the person's writing, they know. And they know what they're writing, whatever that word is. But it's definitely something that I've carried with me all my life. I have a quick question on, um, does that study then prove, say, the glass is yourself we see how it affects the other person but is that also for internal thought yes. about ourselves yes I mean did that study address that specifically because I I've seen proof of that as well um, yeah it, it, it did um, and, and see and that's why you know when doing the seminar that I did was talking about you know vibration people said well that sounds way out there but we're impacted by vibration. For example, the people you meet, have you ever met, before they say a word, you're either connected or you're not. Even those of you that are looking at me, you have an impression of, okay, what kind of guy is this? If I didn't say anything, you'd, you would feel something. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. we, we impact each other in ways we don't understand, but the more we understand it, and it's good to see the images, it's good to see the physicality of it, but when Bar Bernard said about it's the spirit behind it, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, but because physically, you know, too many of us, myself included, we're locked into the five senses, we really only believe what we see, and we, and we have to move beyond depending on just what we see. So when Bernard said there's a spirit behind it, absolutely. And yes. As far as, yes. real quick, as far as affecting ourselves, I, I, th yeah, I, th I don't know what order exactly. I think Deanna was first, but we'll figure it out. Um, we're 80% water, approximately, okay? That's extremely important to remember. All the stuff about full moons and all that stuff, and it's pretty much a known fact. I don't, it maybe, I don't know if it could be proven so much, but we all know it's true because we, you know, if we know anybody that works in hospitals and stuff, we know this that there's something going on. Well, what, what does it? It makes sense, right? If the moon, the gravitational forces dealing on the Earth, the tidal flow and everything else, it affects people because we're 80 percent water, also just like the Earth. I don't know who is next. Well, you know, I have to be careful about Im being impactful on Ben because you saw what happens when I impact Ben. He'll, he'll want to throttle me, right, Ben? <laughs> Go ahead. Right. I just wanted to mention that there is a documentary out there on YouTube. It's either provided by History Channel or the uh, Discovery Channel. But you could just type in in your search, water, 
and they actually do the whole experiment and show you how the water changes. You see it right before your eyes, and it is just amazing. I seen it about a year ago, and so when I saw your pictures up there on the screen, mm -hmm. I thought, wow, this is great. Mm -hmm. But it is so moving to see that because there's so many things in God's element that we don't know. Yeah. We don't know half of what he does, not even a it's, umpteenth yeah. part of it. So it's just wonderful. So if you guys want to watch it, just type in water. I can't remember the name of it, but it's the whole thing about water. Um, I've, I've heard uh, several interviews on Christian radio or Christian television talking about uh, or with interviewing people that had been homosexual in the past that had come out and become Christian. And they talked about they could be within three feet of a person without ever speaking to them and know if they were gay or not. Mm. It's just that close. Caroline was next. Hang on. When we were talking, and I was just sitting here listening, and about the uh, the waves. Okay, this thing just kind of came to me. Whether it be a regular prayer, whether it be unspoken prayer, we put that same signal out there in our prayers to God. So we wonder sometimes why we are not getting an answer for a prayer. It could not only be being, you know, timing, we could be getting in our own way because the way that we are sending those carrier waves to God the Father may not be in an acceptable manner, so he's not going to honor that. That's why you have to have your whole heart. You have to be totally vested. And it's something that I think that, you know, you're only going to get that and have that kind of relationship if you have a strong bond with your daddy and you get that through prayer, study, and meditation. Darla? I think sometimes, at least for me, you know, I second guess those feelings. Um, I learned a lesson. Um, I used to meet with a support group uh, for grief, a grief support group I had met, and we continued meeting after that. One of the ladies got involved with a man who was becoming a, changing to a woman. And we had lunch one day, and I was introduced to this person as a female. And everything in me <laughs> said, that is a female. I mean, that is a male. It just was there. And I tried to suppress my own feeling about what I was sensing. And I'm like, I found, of course, it found that it, he was a male. And I'm like, so I learned a lesson there not to, you know, we can't go on all of our impressions without thought, but I denied something that my, I was being told inside because of what someone else said. And I think it's important to pay attention to ourselves when we have those feelings to see what's going on and not just deny them because, oh, well, what's wrong with me? We have that sense from God. And the other thing I was going to say is we may, we may want to step back and not think those things about people, but when animals sense that, they don't have this. They react positive or negatively. And my husband was a salesman for many years, and we don't have animals in our house or anything, but the, the dogs would come to him, and they'd want to be by him because they felt that sense of love. And so those animals know, and we need to pay attention because God has given us this in a whole different level. Diane. Diane's next, and then Ben. When I walked in, I thought that I might have been hearing something about a, the study with water and frozen mm -hmm. water. Is that Dr. Emoto? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> I, I, I saw those, I uh, saw the... Um, pictures and the videos and the and I, I read an interview that was done uh, subsequent to that and the people because the people would 
pray over the water. Um, so, so you could see, here's the nasty water from so and so, but they prayed over it, and it then it it the water was, you know, crystal looking. But he asked the the interviewer asked uh, whether um, the number of people praying had any impact on it, and he said no. One person praying with a just a real focus and an intent and not distracted was way more powerful than a group of people where one of the people might have been thinking about what's for dinner and the other person might have been thinking about some problem that they had. That, so that's just kind of to echo about, of course, the prayers to our Heavenly Father if we're distracted and whether it's from external things around us because we that we can't control noise factors that we don't have any control over but somehow or another we we still want to be able to pray and overcome that so whatever people do to do that there's several things a person can do but in in this particular case it was better to have a very focused attention and i think that that's probably a very true with our heavenly father well right roger so when we're praying and we're hungry and we're smelling the food out of the kitchen, it's hard to concentrate, right? Yeah. One quick, <clears throat> one quick so, comment I wanted to share since we get went back on that topic just slightly that I heard. Trying to wake you up, Roger. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Roger, you stop talking, man. Just come on, man. Give us a chance over here, okay? Hey, I have to be inspired, man. So, you know, it, uh, <laughs> somebody I inspire Roger with some food comment. Yeah. Roger will work up for that. Well, I will say that uh, there was a movie came out several years ago called Breakthrough. And, uh, you know, one of the things we really miss in our theaters is a lot of good Christian movies. And uh, the Kendrick brothers, the ones that done like Courageous and those movies that came out, uh, they were involved in this movie also. But this was a true story, and I forgot what state or city it was. It was about uh, these guys, these young teenagers was out playing on a frozen lake. And uh, they fell through the ice and one of the teenagers uh, fell through, and by the time they found the kid and got him to the hospital, he'd been dead for an hour, okay? So, you know, the doctors are telling the mother, you know, that you, your son's, you know, he's dead, uh, there's nothing we could do. The mother goes in and just prays, you know, with her heart to God, and a and heartbeat starts back. Well, the doctors continue to say, you know, that, uh, uh, your kid's going to be a vegetable. He'll never wake up. He'll never be right, whatever. And when she caught these doctors actually saying this in front of him, she goes and says, no, you're going to speak life over my child. Amen. Uh, so to go in, and uh, it was what was unique about it was that it, it kind of ended the movie is that uh, they had their big church service, and they were asking that, you know, those that were involved in actually getting this kid out of the water stand up. Well, they stood up. Well, those that were, you know, the doctors and the nurses, please stand up. Those that prayed for this kid, stand up. So this whole town focused on one thing. It was the life of this teenager. And this kid now has done been graduated college. Uh, he is, I mean, he came completely back to life. It was a complete miracle. It's, it's a great movie if you've never seen it. It's called Breakthrough. Uh, it's out there, but it's awesome to where their focus was him. The whole town. The whole town. Yep. So, I mean, have you ever heard of anyone dead for an hour, you know, underwater? I mean, that's, that's, that's dead. That's gone. History. But no, this lady knew who her God was, and she said she wanted life prayed over. So it's, it's a true story. So I just kind of brought yeah, that, that to Yeah, that gives a whole new perspective to Yeshua speaking life into yeah. Lazarus, does it not? And one, one quick thing I want to share before, I don't know who's next, but uh, another story I heard when I was a kid in high school, and this is funny because it's from my electronics teacher, okay, I took electronics classes in high school. So what this story was is basically an experiment that was done with plants, and let's say they, they had a table, let's say, with two plants on it, and they had all the kids in the class or whatever walk by the plants one by one. Well, one of the kids was instructed, and nothing was said, by the way, at all from what I remember in the story. And one of the kids was instructed, had a stick or something, and was instructed to beat the tar out of one of the plants, basically destroying the one plant. 
okay, while the other one's just sitting there. Then I don't know how much time went by, let's say a day or something, maybe a week. I don't know how much time went by. They all walked by again after that. And by the way, they had electrodes on the live plant that wasn't beat up. And then everyone one by one walked by. And when the kid that beat up the other plant walked by, whoop, the voltage or whatever went up. Now, how do you... How do you explain that except something that Ben touched on about God is in everything. God is in everything, and there's water, and wherever there's that water, there's life. It's ben. Ben's next, but you got to come this way away from the speaker, Ben. Oh, I, I'm going to go after Ben. She just went. Oh, Ben, no, she didn't go yet. Yes, yeah, she did. No, that was, no, that was yeah. Diane. Oh, I'm sorry. Diane went. I said I wasn't. I didn't go. I thought you spoke. She's next. You're She's next. next. She's next. Y'all confusing me. Darla, 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 this goes along with what you were saying, so you, it'd be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my sister Talk and I, I'm sorry. It seems so pretentious. But anyways, okay. I will, I will try to speak softly. Right, Jeff? But to my mom. All right. So my sister and I are, are very close, and we're pretty much on the same spiritual level. And she sends me things all the time. And a couple of weeks ago, we were having a really hard time. And um, she sent this to me. And you know how Darla was saying about the, um, the part about women being the weaker vessel and all these things. Well, this woman on here, and it's a, it's a little clip. I don't know if we could play it because it'll do a much better job of explaining it than me. I mean, no, no, just the, just the sound. Like, just the sound. But anyways, it's, for, it's on the verse of Genesis 2.18, when Father says that there was no um, helpmate found suitable, and what that word helpmate means. And what it means is it's the same description that Father uses to describe him with Israel. Mm. That there is a part of the woman that the man doesn't have. That she brings that to the table. And it's beautiful. And we, we say submissive, but we have a place at the table. And, and, and I think in the Christian circles, they tend to say, oh, just be submissive. But it's a more beautiful thing that we come alongside and we compliment and we bring things that they don't have, that y'all don't have. So you don't want me to play it. Yeah, no, those are the, what, what is, I don't know. Well, it's just a little, it's a little video. How long is it? A couple seconds. Okay. Is that okay? Put your microphone up to it. I gotta put it, what, 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 wait, wait. See, I'm so technically challenged here. Hold on, let me get it started. And I have to turn the sound on. Yes. See, I can't get it. Okay, we'll get back to it then. That's okay, I think Ben's next. And then, and then Diane will be next. Thank um, you. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to uh, what Caroline was talking about, about, you know, a lot of times when we don't get answers to prayer, and we got to get to know our father more and more. And I hesitated to hit that like I want to, okay? Because uh, you, anytime you're presenting something new, you want to be able to do it in such a way that people can continue to receive it, right? But we read a verse in <clears throat> James 1, 6, for those of you that were there, and it says that, you know, a double-minded man, <laughs> let that man do not do not expect anything right. okay now that's pretty rough right okay but see this is where when you're about truth there's a time we set feelings aside men or women set it aside what does the verse say when you doubt you should not expect anything okay so now what's the, what's the solution what Caroline said if you want your prayers answered then you got to work at getting rid of the doubt that also means you got to work at getting close to God that also means you got to work at understanding the word at a much deeper level 
Bernard said spiritual. I think the Bible says, or Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Too many Christians, it's up here. It's not here. The people that have it here, even though they may not understand like we understand, but because it's here, they're tapping into how you get answers. God answers prayer whether you keep the Sabbath or not, right? Because mm -hmm. he did say those that seek, that seek him will find, okay? So I just wanted to comment on that, that what, what she said is huge. Mm -hmm. So if you're not getting answers to your prayer, and that's the attitude I took, What's wrong? God, you said, uh, Psalms 37, you get the desires of your heart. I worked on that for about five years because God said it. I wasn't getting results. Well, where's the problem? Me. Anyway, I'm going to let... Beautiful. Uh, Caroline says, God knows when you're all in. How's yeah, that? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Right. Diane has another... Great point about head knowledge. Yeah, the head knowledge, how many people do we know? It's all about the more you know. But there's no translation between what's up here and what's here. And it's like the knowledge, it's all about the knowledge and how much you know and how much you know Hebrew, how much you know Greek, and how much you know the meanings of all these words and all this. The prophecy and biblical numerology, and I know lots of people like this, but their ability to interact with other people, to be loving, to be caring, to lift people up, all they know how to do is condemn based on knowledge, which leads to selfishness, which leads to isolation, which leads to death, both for an individual in terms of relationships with, with others and also for a church. And I, on that note, I always go back to how much did the repentant thief on the cross know when he repented and Christ said, you will be with me. How much did he know? Uh, <clears throat> the... Um the word the helper, help meet, help suitable for, it doesn't mean do everything that person says. It means help them to be the best person that they could be, the person God created them to be. Amen. Debbie. Oh, go ahead. Hand me the mic real quick. So yeah. And it literally and None of us can hear it. Yeah, yeah, it's not going to work. It's not here. I mean, I was a different creature before this and after it because that word helper, I'm from rural Mississippi. Come on. Deep South. Yeah. And so a helper out of my world, my Southern world, is someone secondary. Yeah. The yeah. secondary helps the primary. Right. The helper helps the main one. It's subservient. It's, subser it's sec right. yeah, subservient, secondary. And Ezer in Hebrew, it essentially means helper, aid, or strength, but it's a very strong word. And it carries the idea of strengthening someone in a way they cannot do for themselves. Mm -hmm. And what just bent my brain and like changed my whole soul. Yeah. The moment I learned this was that throughout the Bible, like usually when we see this word Ezer, it's a word that God uses to describe himself in relation to Israel. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. And we would never say that God was secondary to Israel. Uh, sure. We would say God yeah. helped, aided, and strengthened yes. Israel in ways she could not do for herself. Right. So I'm sitting here going, time out. Stop, we Time out. The first word that God chose to use in the narrative of the Bible to describe woman is a word he uses to describe himself. Well, it's beautiful. I think yeah, beautiful. And now, the only, now my, only, my only concern there, she says she's from the South, and I did have heard no Southern accent whatsoever. But other than, well, that, yeah, a little bit. Well, other than that. Well, you, yeah, and now we know where the phrase behind every good man is a good woman. All right, Darla. <clears throat> and then Leon. And then Leon, okay. okay. Um, three things I noticed about that movie that Roger was talking about. Well, technically it might be four, but anyway. We know scripture tells us where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst. Well, that was a whole community. The other thing I noticed was there were Baptist, Methodist, um, I think it was a Greek or Orthodox Jew or something. I'm sure there were Sabbath keepers there. They were together there praying in unity. So what's that gonna tell me? God was in the midst and he performed a miracle. Yeah. So that tells me he is still in the miracle business. And one more thing, 
there was a fireman there. He was one of the ones out in the lake. It was either Missouri or Minnesota. It's one of them where it stays really cold to where the lake ice is over really thick. They had done give up looking for the boy, and they were walking back, and he thought he heard his captain yell, go back further, and he went like, I think he said, five more feet further, because they were having to do this with their legs and a hook, and he found the boy. Well, this was a guy who did not believe in God at all. In the movie, it showed him talking to his captain. He said, well, you told me to go back. He said, I never said nothing to you. So it showed this gentleman questioning where he never believed there was a God. He said, I don't understand this. So then I'd, I'd like to know what happened to him, but it don't say. But he started to question, well, maybe there is a God. Mm -hmm. So to me, God is still moving. Oh, yeah. So there were a lot of things that took place, and we could take from that movie again. That when we're in unity, we're one in spirit. It don't matter what you keep, like you were talking about calendar issues, whatever it may be. The Holy Spirit will be here. And I pray you all have felt it while you were here at the feast. Because if you haven't, you're missing something miraculous. I mean, when you were back here talking a while ago, I could feel it because the hair on my arms was just standing up. And I got all these goosebumps. And you just want to shout it out like, thank you, God. Because it's an amazing thing, and whoo, I gotta stop now, or I'm gonna get <laughs> <laughs> She'll be we'll dead. Hold in here. That's right. <laughs> right. Uh, over uh, Leon, and then Tia. We got about five subjects then, going at the same time. I'm going back to the man and the woman thing. I, I always notice that people forget the very beginning. It says, let us create man, male and female. When he, you can't have a mankind without a male and female. And then when he gave them dominion over the world, he, he said he gave it to the male and the man, male and female. So they've always been together. Is it Satan or somebody else that separates them? Mm -hmm. uh, Diana over there. And then, and then Debbie again. Um, I wish to witness about my granddaughter because this was the power of prayer. She was run over by a riding lawnmower in 2015. She was 30 pounds and she was trapped underneath the mower for over 10 minutes. Uh, she had her arm severed, her shoulder severed, her elbow. She had 22 breaks in her fingers. And her uncle and her father had to turn the lawnmower over and get her out. Her father suffered PTSD. I was called when I was going on my way home. By the time I arrived, the air vac unit was over in the school parking lot loading her in. And all groups of neighbors, people came from the church. They stood out in the front yard with their hands held and prayed for my granddaughter. <laughs> this wasn't the end of it. These people weren't even religious. Wow. And they were praying. They didn't go to church. I had firemen that dropped to their knees because they had never seen such a massive injuries and they were sure that she was going to die. I proceeded to take my son to the hospital at St. Louis uh, Children's Hospital and in the event, as I was doing so, I was calling people that I knew from the church and one of the gentlemen is a nurse. He put it out on Facebook that he needed prayers. I had over, I don't think he told me 3,000 prayers coming through. And on my way to the hospital, I prayed. And this is my first experience at praying and having an answer that was immediate. It wasn't an assurity to me what I wanted because as I started to pray, I said, oh, please let her live. And then I thought to myself, if she lives, she's got a skull concussion. She's got a severed, it's right down to her whatever artery that is up there in the top of your head. It was in fractions of an inch. And it had sliced all the way across the top here at that soft spot. So I stopped praying that. And then I said, well, maybe you could save her arm. You know, it was kind of like a, I was trying to prescribe what I wanted to happen. 
And I realized I was helpless with it. And so I said, you know, you know best. You know whether you want to heal her. You know whether she's healable. If I pray that she lives and she's a vegetable, I'll regret that the rest of my life. So I didn't pray that. I just prayed that he knew best for Naomi and he would do that for her. Today, she's 15 years old. She's a top star track at her school, has made record breaking time. She's an honor student in every class. Today, she's very kind to people. She's very organized. And if people start whining about being in a little bit of pain or they've got a headache or whatever, <laughs> and they'll say to her, I did this to myself. I did this one day. I was in the car with her and I said, you just don't know what it's like to have an abscess tooth because she was carrying on and cracking up and so forth. And I said, could you please be quiet? You don't know the pain of that. She says, no, I only know the pain of having my arm cut off. And, and, and she just went right on. And I said, oh, uh, yeah, you're right. And it struck me, you know, that I cannot pity myself as much as I try to. But uh, I have to account for everything. There were so many people praying. and. We received gifts from around the country. I mean, she got a blanket from some Baptist church in Pennsylvania. She got um, different little books and so forth to look at. In the hospital, every personnel knew her. And she would go in for surgery. She had 22 surgeries. And she was in there for like two, three weeks. But every time they would come up, she said, yep, God saved me. And it was just so matter of fact with her. So she's decided she wants to be, first it was going to be a nurse. And she said, I don't know if I can handle a nurse because I, I really don't know if, whether I want to see people in pain. She said, but I'm going to be an anesthesiologist. So I believe in the power of prayer. And I have seen the hugest miracle I think I will ever see in my life. And she is so grateful. She's not here, and she floats in and out of, of my belief, but she always comes back to it. And she always says, you know, you'll be proud of me. All of my friends are Christians. Oh, so. Wow. That's great. That was awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Debbie's next. Awesome. Debbie. Debbie's next, and then Sarah, I believe. I'm trying to keep track of it. I'm on. Yes. I'm on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I know Bernard said something about knowledge, and um, it's a very delicate middle of the road <laughs> that we have to stay on, but in my life, if I didn't get knowledge, I wouldn't know what I know. And sometimes I feel like people say, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't open that box. Don't look in there. But I think it's so important. And if I could read to you, um, look at my phone, Proverbs 4, 5 through 9. Get wisdom, get understanding, forget it not. Neither decline from the words of my mouth. Forsake her not, and she shall preserve thee. Love her, and she shall keep thee. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting, get understanding. And I think it's so important to do that because we will miss truth that Father wants to show us. And I, I don't mean to be you know, causing any issues or anything, but I do believe it is so important. And that's what we're doing here. We're all edifying one another and lifting each other up and understanding. And I want to know who Father is. I didn't know him. And I want to know him. And he wants me to know him. So. Yeah, yeah I've always attributed uh, knowledge and wisdom. And you're right, we need knowledge. You know, actually, we're all gaining knowledge every day. 
but wisdom mm. is learning how to use that knowledge in the correct way. Yeah, so we you know we've come from cultures to where we've been beat over the head with people's knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay, oh. so with wisdom there is a way to be able to control that knowledge in particular situations. So that's what wisdom is. So wisdom is what we need to be praying for. Yeah. Yes, Ooh. amen. I have a lot of knowledge, Yes, but wisdom is what I'm asking for. So, yeah. yeah. He beat be me yeah. to it good. I think that brought that up. I was going to say that. Sarah? Oh, um, a follow-up on uh, a miracle that, okay. Some of you in this room already know about the miracle that took place what year was it? Five years ago? Um, and how the power of prayer, even the doctors said so, the power of prayer was, was an intervening force with my father. He had a brain bleed and a stroke, brain bleed and a stroke and the doctors attending to him, no, it was 3%. He had a 3% chance of surviving, 3%. Um, this incident happened at church. He was leading songs. And thankfully, uh, Leanne, she's not here, her husband was there and Leanne is a nurse and um, you know he's a doctor and immediately they started attending to him. Everyone in the room started praying and we thought, wait, Winter Family Weekend That's is going we on. Mm -hmm. We texted and say immediate need for prayers with a very brief summary. Everyone, at, I was told that everyone at Winter 500, Family- 500, over 500. Over 500. And some of us reached out to other congregations, I mean, in the moment. So almost instantly, we began praying. He, he should have been in a coma with what happened to him. He should have instantly been in a coma. He never lost consciousness. He spoke through the entire incident. When we went into the emergency room, we had to fight with the doctors because they were ready to send him home. Okay, it wasn't until that point they sent in another specialist because, I mean, he was talking and he was speaking and he was, you know, everything. Okay, so Patrick came in. No, no, Patrick was consulted and it's like, no, this is not normal for him. He, he was slurring words and, and things like that. He said, you need to take another look. And it was at that point, the doctors pulled Mama and me and Rita out and said, 3% chance. But we have to act, all right, she's, she may have. No, it wasn't 3%. They said, this does not happen. It wasn't a 3%. It's like, no, this does never happen. He never comes. If, if they come in with what he had, they're already in a coma. And if you go into a coma, you do not come out of the coma. That's what it was. It wasn't 3%. It's like, so it was a more of a 0%. Okay. All right. So <laughs> they said, I need, you, I need you to let us say it's okay to prepare him for emergency surgery. We already have doctors scrubbing down this urgently now. As soon as you say yes, we're wheeling him out of here and putting him in surgery. Okay, everyone in our local congregation, which is really small, um, I would say 90% of our congregation came to the hospital and we sat and we prayed in the hospital. And um, he went to recovery, woke up, and he spoke <laughs> clearly. Yes. 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 Massive brain bleed. Um, so this is a living miracle. Yeah, yeah. Gary's a walking living miracle, and he, he's giving a sermon tomorrow. Right. Yeah. Tomorrow, Gary's tomorrow giving the sermon. Uh, no, it's Ben, Melbourne. it's Ben, Jenny, then Melba. No, I'm, glad, I'm glad Roger's paying attention. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because I wasn't. And then Melba Gordon. I mean, Howard, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> yeah, we, we got to give Roger some grace. <laughs> uh, wow, I don't even know if I can follow that. Um, I wanted to go back to something that uh, Leon had spoken about in terms of man and woman. Uh, he and I were speaking before services. Um, he, I think Leon said he's, this is his 50th feast this is my 40th feast. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate that we in the church are still struggling with the man-woman role issue. <laughs> Real talk, right? You know the world is, the world's dealing with that issue, okay? We should have already figured it out here in the church so we can be a model for out there. With with everything that's been said, I think if we remain clear on what the roles really are from the Bible, not how it was abused, not how it was mishandled, women didn't do what they were supposed to do, men didn't do what they were supposed to do, we already know that, and that's why we have that out there in the world. Right now, young people, marriage rates are down 65%, okay? And I'll tell you what the young men are saying. The young men that, people think young men today don't want to be married. That's not true. That's not true. The men today, because they see the divorce laws and everything, mm -hmm. for them to be married and it goes, and it goes poorly, it could ruin the man, because he's the one that pays child support, he's the one that pays alimony, and by the way, he's the one that loses his children right. when they go to court. Now, I can speak with that because my, my first wife and I were divorced, okay? So I know what happens, and it took me two years, and I ended up being, a, you know, I, mean, I raised my boys, single dad, okay? I had them for about 10 years, all right? So, the reason why young men today really don't want to be married, it's not worth it to them. Right. And it's not worth it to them because the women are being boss chicks in charge, mm -hmm. and they're saying, I don't want to argue with you. You know what? That's okay. I'll go fishing, and I'll go, okay? And the women are frustrated because they want families and babies. You don't get what you want if we're out of order, all right? Young ladies need to be like Sarah, and they need to be like Hannah, and they need to be like Ruth, and young men need to be like Boaz, and they need to be like David, right? Okay, that's the problem. So as we're talking about the roles, let's make sure that we understand first and foremost, okay, what the order is. And then we can work out the adjustments of, if it's an abuse, we'll address it, man or woman. Because right now, the world right now, if the men are not engaged in the process, there's not going to be families, there's not going to be babies. Men will opt out. Well, that, yeah, we, that's, we're done with that. I mean, well, you got to consider yeah. also, boys are emasculated in public school. Our government's a whole program from there. And then if you look at the college scene, Dating, the dating rules are, you know, you talk about boss chicks, you know, boss women, they run the show and they get, and it's not that women, I mean, biologically women want a family, they're being told from when the time they're in kindergarten, a career. Women are all about a job and a career, not a family. The family's being debased, so that's what Satan has attacked. But it has to begin, as Ben said, within the church, we were supposed to influence the culture. Unfortunately, as we've all seen, the, the culture is influencing the church. And the founding fathers of this country, if we're going to maintain liberty and have it, the church has to influence the culture. Not that the government is religious because it's secular, but the church was supposed to influence the culture. That's how we were designed. That's how it was intended in order for liberty to exist. And what we have is chaos. Everything's out of order. And if you go to what uh, Jeannie's seminar was, it's about Yahweh Elohim putting everything back into order. 
And uh, th this feast is representing an opportunity where Christ is coming back to do what? Put everything back in order. So who's next? Melba. Well, I have another miracle story. Okay, amen. <laughs> My grandson Joe was born about 30, little over 32 years. He was born with infection in his lungs. They flew him to St. Louis Children's. And after they got there, they tried to figure out what was wrong, and I guess they finally got a clue. Anyway, they put him on a heart-lung bypass machine that they call ECMO. And the way it was, it was he, he was on a platform. They had him tied down, and they had him on drugs to keep him so he wouldn't move. And my daughter called me, and she said, Mom, I won't feel like I've done everything I could do for him unless I get him anointed. She says, can you set that up for me? And so I called my minister, and he called ministers in St. Louis, and they got a hold of a minister named Jim Lee. And he came to the hospital they went upstairs, they scrubbed in, and they went in, and he anointed him and prayed for him. Well, there was a young man, a male nurse, was attending him, and he witnessed all this. And they left, and the next morning, when my daughter inquired as to how he was doing, he, they were supposed to take him off the machine the next day so they could use it on somebody else. And, and they said that he's doing terrific. He's shutting the machine down. His platform was going down as he was getting well. And my daughter asked, what time did this happen? Hmm. And they said, right after you left. And he's still alive today. Amen. He's a very kind, very giving person. He sees somebody stop alongside the road, he'll stop and help them change their tire. He does that kind of stuff all the time. And I think God has plans for him. Yeah. I really do. He's starting to know a little bit of the truth from me. Whether he's going to believe it or not, we'll see. <laughs> hey, who's next? Here we go. Mel, did you have something? Okay, we got Mel up here, and then uh, we're getting close to time. Do you guys like this format? We're, we're going to do this one. We're going to do this again on Thursday. So Mel and then Wayne. Oh, Mel and Wayne, okay. Well, I am, I am just so just in love with faith. It's just like I, I just, I don't know. I think it's always been in my blood since I was a little girl. I used to walk along country roads and pick flowers. And I, I think I really do. Like I was like kindergarten, I talked to the Lord just walking. And I, I stepped away from the church for a lot of years, but it's just so strong in me that keep your arms up, keep your hope up, keep your joy up. And we've all seen all kinds of trouble. But when Ben was talking about James 1, before you went there this morning, I was digging in my Bible because I was thinking about, you know, he says that we're like a wave of the sea. If you don't have faith, that you're like a wave of the sea. And that word wave hopped up at me, out at me. And so I was looking it up here, and I went to like... Um, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, right? Like a wave of the sea. So I went to like Jude 113, it talks about wave foaming up their shame, their wandering stars. And then you go to Psalms 107, he calmed the storm to whisper in the waves of the sea. And then when I went and looked it up here, I thought this was really awesome. I just got to share this. So when you look up introduction to waves, um, let me see if I've got the right one here. Uh, hang on here. Okay, so here's the definition, wave Wikipedia. In physics, mathematics, engineering, and related fields, a wave is a propagating dynamic disturbance change from equilibrium of one or more quantities. Waves can be periodic, in which case those quantities oscillate repeatedly about an equilibrium 
uh, of, of some other frequency. It just so blows me away that here we're talking about vibrations and frequencies. And Yahweh, when he was speaking, or Yeshua, when he was, when he was speaking for that through the Holy Spirit, that the analogy of the waves, there's just not a word that he misses. It just blows you away. There you've got it right there, the waves and, and how we, and I've had that time, like I think, I bet we all have. I remember a really, really strong, hard time in my life. Um, and I mean, like I had a, a son-in-law whose mom had been murdered. My ex, I said, how many times does a guy go through midlife crisis? And I had a girl come live with us that they said, Mel would be good for her. Well, I needed like five of me and I only had one of me. And I would pray on the floor and I'd get up and I'd go five feet and I'd get back down on my knees. I would just be crying again. But God just sustained me and it was just like, get your hands up, you can do this. And, and it was just, it, God is so faithful. And when he says to ask in faith, I'm believing more and more and more. And I think we all are that it begins with faith and it ends with faith. It is so pivotal. Yeah. Wayne? Let me get Wayne right here. That's why I like to Wayne. always add in my prayers every so often. Help me in my unbelief. Thank you. Yeah. So we don't doubt. So I'm on a new journey. Um, mother grew up on a farm. Father had a real rough life. Uh, father, alcoholic, died early, stepped in front of a bus when he was drunk. Uh, his mother died in his arms in a, in a flea bag hotel when he was 14. So, but he always wanted to do his best, and they raised us in, you know, normal church, I'll call it, Sunday church. And so that's what I knew my whole life, and I was kind of a rebellious young man, and went in and out of good times, bad times. Debbie and I got married really young, and we've had our struggles in our marriage, but we've been able to hold it together here. And so I was always in Methodist church, Protestant church, uh, Presbyterian church, did a stint in Bible study fellowship for about nine years. That was really good for my personal growth. During, I've always had real high stress jobs so here I am retired, and I go, what's a feast? What are you, what are you talking about? And, and so, what, what? Saturday? I work on Saturday. And so here I am trying to learn all this. It's very new to me. And so I know where I came from. I'm trying to understand where I'm going to. And I have heard so many comments about the Church of God and uh, uh, seems to me, anyhow, like a million derivatives. <laughs> things that have happened uh, in, in that body of doctrine. And I just wanted to ask the question, uh -oh. could someone try to summarize what the history's been and where it is or where it's going, and I'm, I'm really privileged to be in a, in a local church with Bernard and Roger and all the people that go there. It, it's been a blessing for us. But this, this question's in my mind, and, and I keep hearing it, and I, I, I would like a little bit more understanding, if that's possible. Yes, yeah, it we is. we got three but, hours. But can, we we, gonna... can we do that yeah. on Thursday? Yeah, we'll start off up, with that question. Pick it up Thursday. Sure, it may take the sure. whole time. <laughs> well, no, I'm going to try to, well, those of us who have been in the Church of God for a number of decades, maybe we can try to condense it and try to give you the Cliff's Notes version. Remember Cliff's Notes? Try to abbreviate it down without uh, getting it. We all have, a lot of us probably have background and stories that have come out of that uh, uh, corporate organization. I like using the word the corporate church, you know, the top-down group. So, But we'd be happy to talk about that because it is, it is part of how we ended up here. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not, you know, I'm sure all of us have scar tissue. I do. But God uses that in order to get us where he wants us. And so that's actually all things work together for good. Romans 8, 28, right? Mm -hmm. He makes beauty out of ashes, you know, and, and that's, that's why we're here. That's where we're able to do the things we have. But we would be happy to give you the Cliff's Note version. And, and you can throw this in to that later as well, is that, as I learn more about this, I become disappointed in my prior pastors 
and I was around a lot of good people. And why are these things hidden? And I, I assume it's the pressure of doctrine itself and what their responsibilities are to get a paycheck. But uh, that's also in my mind. Well, once I want to mention something on that is that the uh, – um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Uh, couple things. Jeannie, I'm looking forward to Jeannie's thing on the two sticks, and here's the reason why. Something that we've been trying to remind people, Christ is coming back for his body, right? For all the, all the, all the believers, the believers, right? And, and the, we, we as humans make divisions. We set up walls. We set up walls between one another. And just these stories of, uh, you know, people coming together to pray. I think somebody mentioned some atheists were even praying because they were moved so much by a horrible situation, you know. And, and when you were moved by these situations, I think that's sometimes God, God uses those to grab somebody's heart. You know, but something I think we need to remember is, is that too, as we talk about, we, I mean, I, I have a passion for truth. I'm a, as passionate for truth. No one's more passionate for truth than I am. I mean, I'm equal to anybody passionate for truth. My motto has been, uh, ever since I had email, my, my signature has always said, uh, truth seeker, truth seeder. Cause I feel like, well, if I'm <laughs> given the opportunity to understand some truth, that it's my, my duty to share that truth, and I'm talking about whatever it is, whether it's something particularly scriptural, something I, Mike and I kind of hit it off many years ago because we were both focusing on uh, politics. And when I say politics, most people have a very negative thing in their mind. Do you know that we're all politicians? Do you know that we're all ambassadors for the government of God? Do you know that we, that's our job? You know, and so, when I talk about politics, I talk about what should we, it's the study of government is what politics actually means. It's a science of the study of government. So what people call politics out in the world is a whole different thing. But again, one thing, as, we're, as our pursuit, one thing I've learned, at least something I've come to over the past just five years maybe, and, and I've, hint, I've been hinted at it like longer than that, maybe 15, 20 years ago, was, is, is this idea that, okay, yes, I'm passionate for the truth. I want the truth, nothing but the truth. But I've learned something. There's something more important than truth, and that's love. If you have all the truth in the world, first of all, we all see in parts. I don't care how much studying anybody does. doesn't bother me because you're only going to know part anyway, no matter how much you study. But what what I think is more important is than, than understanding all truths is, 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 you know, the difference between knowledge and wisdom, as we touched on before. It's the love that we should be seeking. How much do we hear about people talking about the gifts of the Spirit and all this compared to how much do we hear people talk about the fruit of the Spirit? And, and you know, we say, well, I want to do this, I want to do this, and I was the same way. I want to be a healer, I said at some point in my life a long time ago, you know? But I wasn't focused on what I was supposed to be focused on, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And that's the important part, and that's the love walk. And that's the part that I think people, you know, I could come up and learn all this stuff and impress somebody, but if I'm not walking a love walk, that's the light. That's the light that we're supposed to be out there doing, right? And what is our commission? And I don't care, roles are fine. I see most of the roles having to do it with women. We've talked a lot about men and women. I think most of the roles that we talk about, really, we're talking about husband and wife. As far as the role of every single follower of Christ, what are we supposed to be doing but preaching the gospel of the risen Christ in the coming kingdom? I'm talking about everybody is supposed to be doing this. This is the, what I see as the important part. So when we get hung up on, well, you know, what, what's going on and this, that, and the other thing and all this, well, let's, let's put what's most important on top, and that's growing, growing closer to God and and showing that, showing that love, growing in that love. And to me, that's the most important thing, even though I haven't lost my passion for truth. I'm going to continue seeking truth, but I, I want to try to put it in perspective, I guess. Is, is well, so you don't misunderstand me. I'm, I'm not looking for ammunition. <laughs> and and, and I, I've had the privilege of watching, I've had the privilege of watching you show that love. So oh, I, I understand exactly what you're saying. I'm just trying to get a little bit more background because I, somebody asked me, I'd want to explain it, and I can't. Okay, so that, that's really my yeah, well, well, concern. Not not for ammo. Yeah, not, no, not, not for not ammo. But it's always anybody. good to know, and that's been a problem. Where we come from, and not just wait hold on, not just in Sabbatarian groups. I'm talking everywhere. Right, right. I mean, I was told 
the long time ago, as I was studying and seeking truth in the Bible and whatnot, I was told by somebody in a, I don't know, whether Baptist, Methodist, whatever they were, they was like, oh, well, you can't be a Christian unless you believe God is a trinity. And that was what I was specifically told by somebody, and that got me into a study on that, you know. But we do the same thing, and it, we do the same thing on, on any issue almost. Every I mean, issue. it happens. Every issue. And that's a problem. That's a serious problem. That's right. Did okay. Darla have something? Yeah, Darla had her hand up. Yeah. Okay. Hey. This is not to cause controversy. This is just bringing another side to the story. What Ben was talking about, I agree with a lot of it because I have a 30-something-year-old son who is divorced, has a 7-year-old and a 4-year-old. She's done had DSS out on her twice. She works a job as a nurse in a hospital. Her, um, I don't know what you're calling because she's got four different baby daddies, okay? And I don't mean that to put her down because we all make mistakes, but it's how she lies to the government. She gets all this benefits. She gets all this free crap. We've turned her in. He's turned her in. There's nothing he can do. You go eat lunch with his son, who's seven years old, and he begs me to take him home to his daddy. And there's nothing I can do because the court tells him, Jamie, there's nothing you can do. He pays out all his money in child support. She's got the boyfriend slash fiance being called daddy by the four-year-old and it's causing confusion because Jamie's having to fight this losing battle saying no, I'm your daddy, blah, 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 and so and so and so. I agree with the whole thing what he's saying about men. But I will tell you from a female's perspective of what I experienced because Jamie is not biologically Rogers. He adopted him later on down the road. The first probably three and a half to almost four years it was me and him. Women become that domineering, whatever you, however you want to word it, I forgot how Ben worded it, when you have no support system. When you're doing it all by yourself, when you're being mama and daddy, when the men are not doing their part, and I'm not saying all men are that way because they're not, but this new millennium age guys, and I know you have a daughter who's experienced this, they don't want to work. They don't want to provide. They don't want to do their responsibility as a man. If you say, I need help, whatever, they look at you like you're nuts. Like, why are you not doing this? Why are you not? It's ridiculous. And it's the world that we're living in because it's teaching these young men. I know, Roger can tell you, we got a niece right now. She's got three kids. She works her hind end off. But she, I tell her, why do you even keep him in the house? You're doing it all anyway. Put him out. Get you a real man who's going to be your right. helpmate. They're, they're taking these kids and they're confusing them with the roles. And women do, I don't know what word to use be, other than a bad word. We become this mouthy, belligerent, whatever you want a word you want to name for us because all the shoulders of responsibility are on their shoulders. And we get tired and worn down. Of course, we're doing, it seems like we're doing it all. Well... You know, the, whose fault ultimately that is. That's the fault of the church. Not just our church culture, but all churches. Because if we were teaching our children what Jesus said, husbands love your wives, and explain to our children what that means, we wouldn't be in a situation where the government, because the government helped facilitate the whole divorce culture. You don't need women, you get a job, you don't need a man. And we're gonna make it easy for you to get a divorce and get alimony and all those things. But if the church had taught our children, instead of leaving the schools and the government to raise our kids, Jesus said, husbands love your wives and explain what that meant, we wouldn't be in the position we're in. But now, consequences, consequences. And we're witnessing what happens on top of uh, men not wanting to even date anymore because of all the rules out there, That's we no just... longer have a replacement birth rate in this country. And when you look at what's happening on the southern border, folks, as Syria is we're, our Syria moment is at hand. America has no idea what's about to happen to it. And it's all a consequence of, but ultimately, the church is responsible because we didn't do what was necessary to maintain the culture. That all ties back back to that. So that's where we have to start at the family. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, you skipped, Debbie. On? Okay. You know, it's funny, Darla came over to me. I wasn't trying to be. What Darla is saying and what my comment, it's in alignment. Mm -hmm. That's right. No, 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 no. But here's the thing. What did Michael just say? If the culture is not training, okay, 
So that means we in the church have to train. So I just don't want us getting caught up with, well, men are this or women. No, first and foremost, we must train our boys and young men first. There's a, in creation, who was created first? Adam, let's not forget that, okay? Yes, Eve's, who, who sinned first? Who sinned first? Satan. Who's among, among the creation, who sinned first? Ladies, we, this is, we're talking about truth. Eve did. <laughs> Thank you, Deb. Thank you. Okay. See yeah. what? <laughs> yeah, but let's remember, Eve was deceived. Adam was not. I didn't. Uh, uh, but no, no, no. no. What's his point, Ben? No, ahead. no. I did See, I'm, I'm being specific. You're giving me reasons why it happened. That wasn't what I said. What I said was, who sinned first? Eve. <laughs> and then, well, see, God held Adam responsible yeah. Yeah. because when Adam sinned, he did it knowingly. Yes. Eve was deceived. Right. Okay, so what should we learn? Maybe things that women do at times, men need to intercede and correct the situation. Because one thing about men, unfortunately, when you're a man, it don't matter what the wife did, or the kids did, or the neighbor did. When it's wrong, it's the man, right? When it's good, we did a good job. Did you, everybody catch that? That's how it goes. So men are responsible no matter who's doing what to whom. So because men are responsible, we need to start the training there first. Because the men probably are gonna have to correct things. See, when things are smooth, women can do very well. But when it gets rough, kind of like when men go to war and stuff, we're the men, right? So we need strong men, and I think as a church, we used to teach that, but then we backed away because women didn't have a voice and, and there was abuses. Let's just be careful. Keep the order. Women will be affirmed, men too, okay? That's, so I don't agree, I don't disagree with Darla at all, but Women will have a rough go of it if we don't have, I don't care how strong the woman is, if we don't have a man around, it's gonna be rough. So we shouldn't be surprised at what we're seeing. But we can, like Mike said, Michael said, in the church, we can get that balance where it needs to be and maybe we can grow the young men who can, who can be there to lead the women, the women can support the men, and we can start to turn some of this around. Right, I wanna dovetail something you said here real quick, we gotta to come to a close, because services get to start shortly. When you, uh, what you were just saying uh, about responsibility. That's Abaya's nature. That's our father's nature to take responsibility. If you read the scriptures, you know, because the kids go, why does God say he's responsible for evil? Well, because he's sovereign. And there's a similar nature. Uh, we t men take responsibility because we are made in his image and his likeness. You know, the buck stops with us. Because if we were doing our roles, then we could, you know, eliminate a lot of the consequences that come for sin. And our Father takes responsibility for everything. If you read the scriptures, we got one time for about one, last, one more comment. Last it's comment. gotta be quick. Oh. Gotta it's be gotta quick. be quick. Yeah, it's gotta be quick. No, Either that or guys, save it no, for we Thursday. Got, we'll have to hold on to it till Thursday. I knew it, I knew Wait, Trish has not spoken okay. yet. Oh, look, everybody's got their hands up yeah. suddenly. We're at Wait, the end. Tr let's give one to Trish back there. She hasn't spoken yet today. Okay. Yeah. No, your name's not Trish. We're going to give that to Trish back there. Aww. I know. You shouldn't, have said, you shouldn't have said that was, you shouldn't have said it was long. M mine is quick. We what need to remember. Do? Hold it. Whose head all this needs to fall on? Satan uh -huh. is the one who causes all this. So yep. always keep in mind, Satan right. has caused this. I want to hear what Debbie has to say. Bring the mic back to Debbie. I don't want to miss what Debbie has to say. We got, we're ish still, so go ahead. So we've been talking about answering prayer. Yeah. Okay? I have prayed for this man for 48 years. You just heard a testimony. 
And it's an answer, and I want to praise the Father in heaven. Amen. All to praise. Okay. What he has done in his life. And you do not know the hours that I have spent on my knees. And it's so, I just, so excited. It's just so <laughs> exciting. So thank you. Well, we, how excited we are to have you both here All right, with and us. Then, and then Jeannie, I think, is last, right? Jeannie had her hand up, and that's the last one. we got to get started here. Yeah. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, I was the only thing I wanted to say is that while my program was on order and we are to teach our children well and we should not ignore the female any more than we do the male and we can't put that responsibility on a gender right because if we're not teaching our children correctly it doesn't matter whether they're male or female they are not going to be able to go out into the world I've had both of my kids that I've raised that my grandkids and I've taught them the law, I've taught them what Yahweh expects. And my granddaughter, she goes out into public school and she manages to keep herself clean. She manages to let these boys know, I'm not like that. I'm not going to do that. That's not right. I want an education. I want to be somebody. It's just as important to teach a woman from the very time she's born a baby what they're supposed to do and what the law expects of them because they will not be any healthier and if we have all great men and we still have screwed up women that don't know anything we're still going to get the same thing so i don't think we can concentrate on gender as much as we need to concentrate on human beings amen amen hey everybody i'm sure there, there's lots of thoughts that have come to mind as we're going through this so write down any thoughts or questions or comments or anything between now and Thursday and let's let's talk about it again I know we're gonna start yeah. out with Wayne's we're gonna question. start out with Wayne but obviously you guys like this right it's kind of an interesting having this discussion thank you so much everybody thank you for contributing to